it was somewhere around 1980. And I remember my dad putting me to bed. Like any other seven-year-old, I probably snuck out of bed to eavesdrop on my parents' conversation. Here's what I saw. My parents were sitting in our horribly ugly 1970s style chairs. Let's face it, not a good era for furniture design. And they were facing one another, talking. I also heard my mom laugh before they discovered my arm sticking out from the stairwell and promptly escorted me back upstairs to bed. Damn, caught. Fast forward to 1983, when my maternal grandfather suddenly passed away. I was 10, and this was a shock for all of us. Very soon after his death, I noticed that my mom started sleeping on the couch downstairs, while my father remained upstairs in their bedroom. This is a little thing that had a huge impact because it's right around this time where things began to get rocky in my house. Now, when I got to junior high, my parents called a family meeting. Ugh, anxiety. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but in my house, when a family meeting was called, oh, it definitely meant that one of us was in trouble. Either one of us got caught lying about something, you were messing up in school, or you weren't doing your fair share of chores in the house. But this family meeting was different. It was tense. My parents weren't looking at each other. My brothers and I weren't goofing around. They sat stoically on the couch with me in between them. Now, I can't recall which one of my parents spoke first, but they announced that they were separating. And the rest of the family meeting, it went exactly how you think it might. We still love you, blah, blah, blah. It's not your fault, blah, blah, blah. I was stunned. Perhaps that's why I don't remember much. When I asked my parents what happened, they each had a different version of the story to tell. But something my dad said stuck with me forever. He said, we love each other, but we stopped liking each other. You stopped liking each other? Huh? Is that a thing? Uh, you might have figured out by now that I was a very curious kid, unrelenting in my quest to figure out the why of things. And as a psychologist, I get to work with incredible clients to help them figure out the why in their lives. I'm sure that the breakup of my parents' marriage subconsciously influenced me to work with couples in some of their darkest moments. Couples counseling is exciting, exacerbating, overwhelming and completely unpredictable. It's a little like watching any good sporting event combined with a nature series. The female is crying, clearly upset about something happening in the relationship. The male slowly reaches for her hand, his eyes misty. And as the couple's therapist, I'm thinking, yes, yes, yes. The male gently touches her hand and she says, get your hands off me. Don't touch me. I still don't trust you. Foul, foul, I cry. <laughs> this is exactly what happens in couples counseling. Couples fight hard to find their way back to one another after anger, hurt, misunderstanding and disappointments get in the way of their closeness. Researcher John Gottman and his colleagues performed some groundbreaking research in the 1990s and 2000s where he found that he could predict divorce with about 91% accuracy simply by listening to a couple's interactions for five minutes. 
you and your partner should not sit next to Dr. Gottman on a plane. He brought couples into his lab, deemed the love lab, and observed them performing tasks together like cooking, watching TV, and solving problems. And he found that when couples engaged in something he called the four horsemen of the apocalypse, criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling, they were likely to lead to divorce. Gottman says that criticism usually begins with a harsh startup and ends with attacking your partner's overall character. The difference between a complaint and a criticism is something like this. Hey, hun, can you please remember to take the garbage out? You keep forgetting, and it is so frustrating. Versus, what's the matter with you? You're so stupid that you can't even remember to take the garbage out. Now, you can clearly see the difference here, can't you? One isolates a behavior, and the other attacks your partner's overall character. Now, contempt can include things like sarcasm and cynicism and places one partner as being superior to the other. Name calling, eye rolling, sneering, and mockery are all signs of contempt. Now, defensiveness is harmful because it gets in the way of us actually listening to our partner. It instead actually blames them for part of their dynamic, and it doesn't allow us to accept responsibility for our part. I might actually take the garbage out if you weren't such a control freak, but I can't do anything right as far as you're concerned, so why should I bother? What's the point? Now, stonewalling is the worst of these because it communicates to our partners that they don't matter. The stonewaller is emotionally unresponsive and withdrawn, and they often stare off like this when being spoken to. Each of the four horsemen is harmful, but stonewalling is the worst of these because it often foretells the death of the relationship. Researcher and couples therapist Sue Johnson's emotion focus therapy talks about the importance of having a close emotional bond with your partner. She says that we come to our relationships with needs and expectations for emotional closeness, comfort and security, and when these needs aren't met, we are wounded and deeply hurt. Both of these theories support what I've seen in my own work with couples. Without emotional closeness, our relationships really do struggle. Some of you are already familiar with this very disturbing statistic, but about 50% of first-time marriages end in divorce, while nearly 67% of second marriages do. This doesn't even begin to calculate the breakups occurring of non-married couples each year. What is happening? How can we fix it? Well, here's what I found in my own work with couples. A little really does go a long way. A little negativity can go a long way to hurting your relationship. Negativity consists of things like insults and criticism and thinking that you're so much smarter than your partner that you question why you're with them in the first place. <laughs> this is exactly what couples counselors deal with all the time. The colluding look from the other partner that says, do you see this? Do you see this here? He's an idiot. She's crazy. I know that you see it. I just know that you do. Everyone has a narrative to tell in couples' work. Both partners have completely different viewpoints about what's happening, why, and whose fault it is. I've got news for you. Couples counselors, we don't solve couples' problems. We help the couple heal their process with one another. We help the couple listen to one another. We help the couple restore emotional closeness. A little goes a long way. Contempt, anger, thoughtlessness, selfishness, and infidelity, oh, it goes a long way to destroying your relationship. 
when resentment first appears in your relationship, and it will. Couples can figure out what it means together. Resentment is meaningful, and it usually means that something needs to change. Maybe one person needs to take the garbage out instead of the other, but when resentment is ignored or buried, it becomes another destructive negative pattern hurting your relationship. A little goes a long way. When your partner reaches for you, physically or emotionally, do you respond to them in the moment or do you ignore or reject them? The Gottmans call these bids for affection and connection, an emotional reaching out, an attempt to share something important, maybe something that happened at work or something on TV. What do you think happens when these bids are rejected or ignored time and time again? What is the message sent? I don't have time for you right now. You're not important or I don't care. Woo! Do you want to be in a relationship with someone who helps you feel this way? Me either, yet these are not uncommon scenarios. A little goes a long way. But wow, here's something truly exciting. A little positivity goes a long way too. A little positivity goes a long way to healing what hurts, to fixing what's broken. Positive things like being kind and thoughtful, like I know that you've had a hard day. Go relax while I make you dinner or thank you for emptying the dishwasher. I really appreciated that. Or you went all out for my birthday celebration. It made me feel very cared about. Expressing appreciation and gratitude for the things your partner does for you lets them know that the way they care for you matters. And when we feel like we matter, remaining committed is that much easier. Listening, just listening to your partner without giving advice or your opinion on how you think they should handle something goes a long way to making them feel cared about. Saying I'm sorry and actually meaning it can be healing and transformative after a conflict. So can making a plan to change and sticking to it and being honest with your partner about your own struggles. These are the little things that matter so much. A little goes a long way. Responding to your partner's bids for you, oh, it's powerful for both of you. It'll make both of you feel cared about and important to one another. A little goes a long way. Romantic relationships are in themselves revolutionary because to form and keep a close emotional bond with another human being brings forth all kinds of challenges because let's face it, they aren't you. I know this is going to come as a shock to everybody here, but they don't think how you think, feel what you feel, or see the world in the same way you do, which is why the little things we do matter so much. Emotional connection is based on a series of little things like saying I love you and showing your partner in the ways that they need it nearly every day. Consistently keeping your promises to do little things like empty the dishwasher, set aside time to talk or seeking physical closeness because these things build trust and demonstrate our commitment to our partners over time. Having insight into your partner's worlds and being able to self-reflect on how our behavior impacts our partner is another little thing that matters so much. When our partners see that we're trying, they're far more likely to give us the benefit of the doubt. A little goes a long way. Little things add up to big things. Little things create patterns over time. 
Little things can make or break your relationship. So now, a long married person myself, I understand much better my parents' struggle. I totally get what my dad told me about why they broke up. We love each other, but we don't like each other. This nugget of wisdom has served me so well in my work with couples. Most of the couples I work with don't like each other very much when they first come in to counseling. I had no idea the powerful lesson my dad taught me that day was that maintaining liking your partner can often be more difficult than maintaining loving them over the long haul. Maintaining like and caring of your partner requires us to do little positive things nearly every day. Having a friendship with your partner can be such a challenge at times, but it is so important over the long haul. The most revolutionary thing of all is not doing anything that I've talked about today. It's maintaining doing the things that I've talked about today, day after day, month after month, and year after year. And as for my parents, ironically, they found their friendship again. After my brothers and I were long out of the house, <laughs> maybe it was us, they started doing the little things that they'd neglected to do when they were together. Things like talking again, spending time with one another, and showing one another appreciation and gratitude. In fact, in the last note my mom left us after she passed away, as my dad had years before her, she wrote, your dad was the best. He absolutely felt the same. A little really does go a long way. Thank you.